Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. Glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you are not aware, my name is John, and I am uh, blessed to be the pastor here today. And I thank you for being here. And uh, what a what a powerful song when we hear the fact and hear other believers gather together and say, "We exalt Thee." Is Jesus worthy of our praise? You can do better than that. Is Jesus worthy of our praise? He is, isn't he? And so I'm excited today because this, as Stephanie said, this is one of my favorite times of the year as well. Uh, Project 938, we're talking about missions and uh, really about giving to missions. And I don't know if you caught what Stephanie was saying this morning, that about 10 years ago, God allowed this church to send missionaries to the other side of the world where it's not legal to proclaim the gospel. And these people gave their life to Jesus. And they were the first people in their village to know the name of Jesus. And this week, in fact, just before I walked up here this morning, I watched the video of 18 people gathered in a room hearing the name of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? I think you should get more excited than that. That is awesome that people have heard the gospel. And so I want to encourage you. I know Stephanie did, but I want to encourage you on your way out today. There's a couple things you probably should grab. They're on the table right in the foyer. Grab one of these booklets. Okay, probably every person in your family doesn't need one, but there is a schedule in there. And I would say also, if you have children who are going to be coming Wednesday and Thursday Every child's going to want one of these. There's an area in there that has like this passport. So when they go to the different locations this week, they can get their passport stamped and they're going to get to go all over the world right here from this location. And so Shad and Stephanie have worked really hard. We have over 20 missionaries that you're going to get to hear from this week. So let me encourage you, Wednesday and Thursday night, 6 o'clock, we're going to meet in the Family Center we're even going to feed you just because we want to take away the excuses. We want you to be here. Families, you get to go into all the rooms together, and you're going to get, okay, you're going to get this boarding pass, okay, as you show up on Wednesday, and it's going to tell you where you need to go. I'd like to tell you where to go sometimes, but this is going to tell you where to go, all right? I, that just kind of slipped out. Sorry about that. There's also some of these books back there on Faith Promise, what Faith Promise is. If you need that resource, feel free to take it. Hopefully you were in Connect Group earlier this morning, or you're going to go to Connect Group when we're done this morning and hear about what Faith Promise is. And make sure you grab one of these Faith Promise cards. How many of you are familiar with what this Faith Promise commitment card is? Would you put your hand up? All right, leave it up. Everybody kind of look around. So that might represent maybe 60%, maybe a little higher than that. That's, that's awesome. It's kind of what I was assuming. Um, but what this represents is every year since the early 70s, Hallmark Baptist Church has been a part of Faith Promise Missions Giving. And so pretty much every year without fail, we take about a week, sometimes longer, to have a missions emphasis. What I'm encouraging you today is to take one of these home pray about it. And then what I'm going to encourage you to do is next week, we're going to have an opportunity at the end of the service to hopefully you've already filled this card out, bring it back, put it on the altar and pray uh, for God to bless our missionaries. And so one of the biggest ways for us to fund the missions program here at Hallmark is we have a lot of people who fill one of these out every single year and they make a one-year commitment that I'm going to support the missions endeavors of Hallmark Baptist Church. And so that's what this is. This is simply for you an opportunity to make a commitment for the next year to give. My guess is, as you saw many of the people who raised their hands, that many of them have been doing this for a long time. And uh, so I want to challenge you for Project 938. What, how many of you know what Matthew 938 says? Okay. I think it was quoted a little bit in a prayer maybe this morning that God would send forth more laborers into his harvest. So here's my, my prayer for you. Today, Wednesday and Thursday, 6 o'clock, 
you're going to get to hear from a lot of missionaries. Let me encourage you, we won't have anything here on Friday, but on Saturday at 5 o'clock. Okay, how many remember the old um, international dinners? You guys remember the old international dinners when you had food and all of you wonderful ladies would bring the potluck, right, and uh, from all over? Well, we're going to do similar to that, but we're going to bring food trucks in. And so you're going to get to experience food trucks that have different varying foods, all right? So five o'clock Saturday, okay? So I'm just giving you a refresher here. Wednesday and Thursday, six. What time should you be here Saturday? All right, you guys are so brilliant, all right? But what I'm asking God to do in your heart, what I'm asking you to pray about this week is that God would give you a burden to do more for missions than you're currently doing. Maybe, maybe someone in the room this morning or maybe someone this week, maybe it's a student, maybe it's a young adult, maybe it's a young couple, maybe it's a retired couple, maybe it's a fifth grade student, that God's gonna speak in your heart and say, listen, I want you to go. And who knows where God might want you to go to share the good news of Jesus. So be here Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, okay? So my goal is that all of us somehow, some way would be involved in missions, okay? Let me say that again. My goal is that all of us somehow, some way would be involved in missions. And you know what that means? That means you, okay? I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, that means you. Okay, say it with a little more conviction. That means you, all right? And how many of you are fighting over, like, we're looking at each other? No, it's you, all right? So today, I want to talk to you about investments, okay? So there's this question, the only picture I want to show you that says, what are the best investment plans for me? Now, I'm, I'm getting up to the age where I really need to be thinking about this more, right? Like, I'm going to be ready for retirement. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that my two children will take care of me well in retirement, so I need to, I need to prepare myself. My, my dad may be saying the same thing, I'm not sure. One thing I do know about investments, investing can be volatile. Do you agree with that? Investing can be volatile. I mean, you can look at any kind of investment graph and it's like up and down, and especially it seems like over the last few years, it's, investing has been very volatile. One thing I do know about investments, how many of you know what ROI, the abbreviation ROI stands for? Okay, how many of you know what that stands for, right? Put your hand up. I'm just curious, like maybe, maybe 50% of you in here, and probably the rest of you will know what it means when I say it, but uh, let's say it together, okay? What does ROI stand for? Ready? Return on investment. Okay, so you typically want to have an idea if you're going to get a return or what kind of expected return you're going to get before you invest in something. That, that's my free advice for you, Money Matters by John Haley, all right? And this morning, I want to think about the greatest thing you could invest in. What's the greatest return on your investment? And so I think about this statement we made two weeks ago. Maybe you remember, we said find, or excuse me, found people do what? Find people. We've, talked, we've said this statement a lot, that the gospel came to you on the way, can you finish the sentence, on the way to someone else. Jesus said it this way when he came to the disciples, he said, follow me and I will make you, what is it? I will make you fishers of men. He, he spells it out more specifically in Matthew chapter 28. This is right before Jesus is going back to heaven. And remember what he said? He said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. And what is Jesus going to commission his disciples? What is he going to commission the church to do with all authority given to him in heaven and earth? In Matthew 28, 19, he says, go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded. And lo, I will be with, with you always, even until the end of the age. So here's this commission, and I believe that a, a great commitment to the Great Commission 
will build a great church. A great commitment to the great commission will build a great church. In other words, God has commissioned us to make disciples. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I don't want you to show it on the screen yet, all right? So the next slide should be Romans 10, 13, but don't show it yet, okay? Romans 10, 13. How many of you know what Romans 10, 13 says? Okay, raise your hand, all right? You probably do. I bet more of you do than you know you do, okay? And if you knew what I know, it's, I'm not even gonna tell you. All right, if you wanted to cheat, I am gonna tell you. the, the, the next screen that's going to be up there is already on the back screen. Did you guys know that? Don't turn around, you cheaters. <laughs> if you know Romans 10, 13, will you say it with me? For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How many of you knew it, but you didn't know you knew it, right? You just didn't know the address, right? That's an awesome verse. Whoever... What is who, who does whoever speak of? We're such deep theologians here, right? It's whoever. Whoever calls on the Lord shall be what? Restored, reconciled, relationship with God, eternal life, forgiveness, home in heaven. That's all that this word saved encapsulates. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be, what is the word? Saved. Isn't that an amazing verse? And we've kind of spelled that out over the years. We're very clear about the ABCs of salvation. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? I think you could summarize that or expound on that actually with the three letters, A, B, C. The Bible says, Paul wrote in Romans, earlier than Romans chapter 10, he wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, to call on the name of the Lord is like this three-step process that I'm going to admit I'm a sinner. Looking around the room, that should be pretty easy for you to admit. That was supposed to be funny, right? Admit I'm a sinner. B, I'm going to believe. What did, what did John write in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that whoever, what? Whoever believes in the name of the Lord shall be saved. You'll have eternal life. Admit, believe, and confess. In Romans 10, we we just looked at verse 13, but in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, it says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, it leads to salvation. You guys should be excited about that. Whoever calls the name of the Lord, that means anyone and everyone, if they will admit and believe and confess, they can have salvation. Isn't that good news? But but Paul takes a turn in the next verse. He says, wait, wait, hold on, there's a problem. And he presents a problem to us with four questions. Romans 10, 14, and 15 says this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? So he has these four questions. He makes the declarative statement. Whoever calls on the Lord, they have salvation. They have forgiveness of sins. They have restoration and reconciliation. They have a home in heaven. They have eternal life. This is great news, but there is a problem. How can they call on him if they have not believed? Kind of backs it up a little more. Well, how can they believe in someone they've not heard of? let's, Let's personalize this a little more. How can they call on Jesus if they have not believed in Jesus? And how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard of Jesus? And how can they hear of Jesus if someone doesn't tell them about Jesus and How can someone tell them about Jesus unless someone sends them to tell about Jesus? So there's this great statement, whoever calls on the Lord shall be saved, but there's a problem. How's everybody going to hear? How's everybody going to know? We see an example of this that we've seen in our church over and over and over again throughout the years. But in Acts chapter 13, we see the answer to the problem. 
the answer to the problem, how can people hear if no one goes and tells them? That's the simple summarization of those four questions. In Acts 13, it says this, verse number one. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there was a certain prophet and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up in Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. In other words, he's just describing a very diverse church. Like, they're diverse in all aspects of diversity. And in verse number two, it says, that as they ministered, so as the church was just being faithful to the Lord, in terms that we would use, as they led people to find and follow Jesus, as they were making disciples of all nations, as they were living in unity in community, as they were living like the church is supposed to live, they were fasting and praying. Look what it says. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And so we have this problem. Everyone who hears, whoever calls them Lord can be saved, but not everyone has the opportunity to hear about Jesus unless someone goes and tells them. And so the church is meeting, they're gathering, they're doing what church is supposed to do. And then the Holy Spirit says, hold on, I want to call those two people and I want to send them to somewhere else so someone else can have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And look at number verse, uh, verse number seven, uh, three says, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, the church sent them away. And this idea of sent them away, is not like you know, we're kicking them out. It's actually more the understanding of we are releasing this, these two individuals that's speaking of, we are releasing them to do what God has called them to do. We see that God's called them into an, another area of ministry to go to another place to tell other people who've never heard the gospel. And we are agreement with the Holy Spirit. This is God's call in their life. We, we modeled that as a church a few months ago. Remember when uh, Pastor Dave and, and his wife Dawn, they've been serving faithful for all these years, just like we see in the scripture here. And God said, hey, I want to send those, I want to send that family to another place so other people can hear the gospel of Jesus. And what did we do as a church? We laid hands on them and we prayed and we did not kick them out. We did what? We released them to do what God had called them to do. Amen. That's the picture I want you to mark in your calendar March 6th, because on March the 6th, we're going to get to do this again. Donald and Stacy Burrell, who've been faithful members of our church for many years, God has called them to another place in Como to serve another church. And we as a church see the calling of God in their life. And what do we want to do? What do we see in scripture that we should do? We're going to lay hands on them and pray over them, and we're going to release them to do what God has called them to do. We've seen this over and over as uh, Stephanie came and gave the welcome several years ago. God came and said, I want those people, and I want them to go over there. And what did we do as a church? We prayed over them, we saw God's call in their life, and we sent them out. But not everybody who gets sent out well, in just a few weeks ago, remember we had David and Kim Hayes on the stage here. And they're going back to Kenya. And what did we do? We brought them up from the church. We laid our hands on them. We prayed over them and we, we sent them out. But here's what you need to understand. Maybe you're not aware of, like David and Kim Hayes, the only way that they can do what God has called them to do is that churches like ours send them money so that they can live in another country and start feeding centers and start schools and start churches. And we get to be a part of that. And I want to just read real quickly this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Because what we're talking about this morning is investment. We're talking about giving. We're talking about giving because God has called people to go. And so we, listen, everyone in the room, we should be willing to go wherever God has called us to go. But we should also be willing to give for those who God has called to go. And we have an example in Corinthians of a church that was generous. Verse number one, 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of all their liberality. Listen, these, this church, what Paul is talking about, these churches were poor, They were being persecuted. 
But what's their response? With great joy they gave liberally. For I bear witness, verse 3, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability. There's what we talk about. We talk about faith, promise, giving. This is what Paul is saying, like beyond their ability. These are poor churches without resources, probably lost their jobs because they're proclaiming Jesus. They're being persecuted. And Paul says even in their persecution, they gave abundantly beyond their ability. Verse 4 imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry and the saints, not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But verse 7, but as you abound in everything. So here's where Paul challenges the church. He gives them an example of a generous church that they gave beyond their ability that they had great faith that even in persecution and even poverty, they gave so that Paul and Silas and missionaries could go. And so now Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, I'm challenging you with the example of the other churches. And look what he says in verse 7. As you abound in everything, like he's, he's commending them, you have faith and you have great speech and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love for us, it sounds like what we are praying as a church, right? We, they, they loved God more. They knew God more. They were sharing God more, But then he says, I want your grace to abound in this also. That you would abound in this grace also. What grace is he speaking of? You, you see it on the screen here. See that you abound in this grace also. What is Paul saying? You would give more. You would abound in the grace of giving the ability to give. And Paul says the people gave the model. Three descriptive, descriptive words I want to give you. The church gave joyfully, they gave generously, and they gave sacrificially. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that kind of church. Do, do you want to be a part of that kind of church? And let me just brag on this church, not on me, on this church. This church has been that kind of church. And I want to continue to be. And some of you have come into our church and you're new to this idea of faith, promise, giving. And I just want to say, I'm, I want to challenge you to jump in. Get involved. Give joyfully, generously, and sacrificially. And let me just, by way of side note, I would never ask you to sacrifice if I wasn't doing it myself. We talk about investments and, and sacrifice. So, uh, as I kind of jokingly said, I'm preparing for retirement because who knows about my kids, right? And I'm guessing a lot of you are re preparing for retirement. If you're not, you probably need to start doing that, okay? But you know, in order for me to prepare properly for retirement, I have to sacrifice now. Right? This isn't, you guys are looking at me like this is really hard to comprehend. This is easy stuff, right? If I'm going to have money when y'all stop paying me, I got to save. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. All right, it's, it's very simple. I'm not, I'm not setting you up for anything, all right? But it takes a sacrifice. And every month when I send that money to where I'm trying to save it for retirement, I sometimes think, my 2008 truck with almost 200,000 miles, it sure would be nice to have a new truck. Can I get an amen to that? And I think, if there's going to be money when I'm 65, I'm going to keep driving this truck, right? Right? It's just basic understanding. But I wanted to tell you this morning about investing in something that's far greater than retirement. That has a much greater return on investment. And similar to me in my own life, I have to make sacrifices to save for the future. I also have to make sacrifices 
to give so others can go. And I'm, I'm thankful that my parents raised me from a little bitty to learn how to tithe. I'm thankful that my wife's parents taught her when she was little how to tithe. I'm also thankful that we learned from a very young age to give above our tithe to missions. And since we've been a part of this church in 1997, we've also been a part of a building offering. And if someone has $1.8 million and you want to pay this off, I could stop that payment. That'd be great. I'm, I'm, I'm only saying this to say I'm, I would not ask you to sacrifice if I wasn't too sacrificing. And everybody's sacrifice looks different. But what if, what if you made a sacrifice? You went home this week and you pray, God, what would you have me, what would you have, $5 a week? I, I don't know what God would encourage you to give. I know there's people in our church that have been retired for 40 years who still give it every week to this. So let me share with you quickly what the return on your investment is. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Paul is writing to another church. And Paul wants to commend them. He's thanking them. Remember in December we walked through this text in Philippians about joy to the world. And we read over this passage before I mentioned it. But look at verse number 14 of Philippians chapter 4. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know all that is in the beginning of the gospel. When I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Again, he's just thanking them for being a generous church. They gave so he could go. Verse 16, even in Thessalonica, you send aid once again for my necessities. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Let's finish reading the text, and then we're going to get back to, to verse 13. Verse 18, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things you sent for me, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. I love this verse. Paul says, because of your generosity, because of your gift, because of your sacrifice, it was a, a sweet-smelling sacrifice, not to Paul, but to the Lord. Like the Lord is blessed when you bless. When you give generously, it blesses the Lord, and it's a, a sweet Sm smelling aroma, he said. Verse 19, there's a promise to those who give sacrificially, generously, and joyfully. What does Paul say? My God shall supply all your needs according, according to what? His, his resources. Is God limited in his resources? No. And Paul is saying, because you gave generously and sacrificially and joyfully so that others could go and hear the gospel, trust God, he will supply your needs. And I wish we had the time this morning to call people up on the stage and tell you some of the people in this church have been giving to Faith Promise for years and years, and they, they have so many stories of God's provision. In fact, uh, a few months ago, we... We watched a video of Pansy Weesey. Pansy, I think, 92 years old now. She's not here this morning, so I can talk about her, okay? I, I called her this morning and just encouraged her, but on the video, and she's told me this plenty of times over the years, her husband and, and uh, they, they had sent a son to be a missionary in the Philippines, and so they, they were all in on missions for many years. And her husband always gave more and gave more. And, and when he passed, she said, I don't know if I can keep this commitment that Carl made. And I don't know if you remember her on the video saying, God always provided. I was able to keep the commitment 
that my husband made. And this is what Paul is saying. My God shall supply all your needs. So let's not, let's not like quickly go over verse 17. Let's go back to verse 17. This is what we started out talking about this morning, the return on investment. Here's what Paul is saying. I'm thankful you gave the gift, but here's what he's acknowledging. Not that I seek the gift because I need it. In other words, Paul is saying, look, God's plan is for us as a church to give so that others can go. That's, that's very clear. We've kind of laid that out for you today. But Paul is saying to us, and if he could talk to you today, he could say, listen, whether you give or not, God is going to provide for people to go. Do you understand that? Like God doesn't need your money. We just, we just declared God has all the resources. It's his. It's not yours anyways. It's a great principle of ownership. It all belongs to God. Paul is saying, listen, I'm glad you gave. Thank you for giving. You were generous. You were sacrificial. You were joyful. It was a sweet sacrifice to God. But I want you to know that God was going to provide for me either way. But here's the, in, here's the return on investment in verse 17. Here's why Paul was so adamant. This is why this morning, I love talking about giving to missions. I love challenging you to give more to missions. If you're not giving to missions, to start giving to missions. And this is why. This is what Paul said. Because the people who hear the gospel, the people who respond to the gospel, Paul says that fruit of a new life in Christ will be added to your account. In other words, if you take a step of faith and you give so others can go, what Paul is saying is those people that we just talked about, the 18 people in the room who would have never heard of the gospel if someone hadn't went, that's fruit Amen. to your account. Hold on. If, if you invested. And if you don't invest, the return, it's not yours. If I don't invest for my retirement, nobody else is doing it for me. If I don't invest through giving to the local church for missions, Paul is saying the investment, the return, it's not yours. Let, let me just give you a small picture of your investment. Um, now, most of our missionaries, if you're not familiar, most of the missionaries we support, which is like 175 missionaries or so, that we send money to every month because of your generosity. And because of your generosity, um, most of our missionaries are a part of the organization called Baptist Bible Fellowship International. That's most of our missionaries are approved by them. And that's where if you give a dollar to missions, it goes to the BBFI, to those missionaries, and that dollar goes straight to the missionary. Nobody's, nobody's got their hand out taking part of it, okay? So you can trust that. Just out of the missionaries from the Baptist Bible Fellowship in 2020, they're still gathering the numbers from 2021, but 2020, remember, was a pretty weird year with COVID. But of the reports from our missionaries, 61,848 people gave their life to Jesus. Amen. You can clap for that. 61,848. Do you think that the return on investment is worth it. It is. And I'm just telling you, you are the one missing out if you're not involved. When they showed me that video right over here in the room this morning of those people, I thought, thank you, Lord, 
for letting me be a part of that. Thank you, Lord, for people investing in my life to teach me the benefit of sacrificial giving. I have tons of numbers I could give you, but I won't give you all of them. But I want you to think about this. Just from, and, and I could, again, there are about 175 missionaries that we send money to every, every month. But let me just share you like a, a snapshot, kind of like this broad view of, of when you give your money through Hallmark to missions. Right now, there are churches on Indian reservations in the United States because you give. Right now, there's a, a new church that just started meeting on Sundays in Bar Non, Wyoming. Do you know there's a church that meets just outside of a dump site in Cambodia? And the reason they meet outside the dump site in Cambodia is because that's where the people live, in the dump. And I've been there and I've seen that. And they live off everyone's trash. And because you give, Pastor Seahawk has a church right outside the dump. And people give their life to Christ. There are schools in Kenya. There's a church for gypsies in Romania. Did you know that in northern Romania? I've been there. Amazing story of how Pastor Tinka gave his life to Christ. They were, so they were in Romania. They've heard of God. They don't know who he is. They meet in this room, and they gather, and they're, pray, they're having a prayer service. They don't know who to. And they're just saying, God, if you're there, send somebody to tell us. And guess what? A guy named Walter Stevens was in the town asking God, where do I go preach the gospel? And Walter Stevens, someone led him. So Walter Stevens was a gypsy, not from Romania, but they led him to these other gypsies. They're in the middle of their prayer service, praying that God would send someone to tell them about Jesus. Walter Stevens walks in and says, hey, he walks in the middle, like they're kneeling down, they're praying, and he walks into that. And guess what he does? He tells them about Jesus. Amen. And now they have a church and a man, a feeding center. I could go on and on about the stories of what God is doing. We have an orphanage in the Ukraine. And Chris over here has spent a lot of hours building that orphanage. Churches in Siberia, a feeding center in Pakistan, a seminary in Cuba. It's just a little bit of what God is doing all over the world. Because people sacrifice. And I want to I read you an email. So I got an email yesterday morning um, from Pastor Seahawk, as I mentioned his name. I also got an email from a, a church plant. You know, we were part of a church plant in Cape Cod. And you know, in Cape Cod, 98% of Cape Cod does not claim any kind of a church affiliation. 98% of Cape Cod does not claim any church affiliation. You know what they need in, in Cape Cod? A Bible-believing church. And you know what? We're supporting a church in Cape Cod. Anyways, that's just another email I got last night. Let me read this email from Pastor Seahawk. And as I read it, there's going to be some pictures that kind of describe what I'm, I'm reading. And I love the emails I get from Pastor Seahawk because it reminds me, it sounds like uh, Paul writing to the church. My dearest, beloved, and respectful pastor, John Haley and Hallmark Baptist Church, great, warmest greetings from Liberty Bible Baptist Church in Cambodia. My dear pastor, I hope this email finds you and your family and your church well. First of all, please allow me to say thank you and very much, pastor, for your always such wonderful generosity of heart, God's mission in Cambodia through your great prayer and, and great financial support. My dear pastor and church, please allow me to give you the report of our youth camp that we did last February 4th and 5th, 2022, um, in a little, it's called Rabbit Island, if you want to look it up. We are thankful to God. We have 75 campers attending, and praising God, there are 15 young people who made a profession of faith. Twelve got baptized. Forty campers came to the front to make a promise of surrender. We are blessed with a great program. 
May God bless you and your family and your church always. Much love to you, my dear Pastor John and church. And this last picture, there's 13 people standing in the, and this is the South China Sea. Here, this is the return of investment. Isn't that exciting? So I, I, don't, I don't have any problem saying give so people can go. I want to ask you to just close your eyes for a moment as the worship team comes forward to lead us this morning. And I want to just challenge you this morning before we stand and we sing this last song in a moment. Would you make a commitment today, right now? I'm going to take one of these cards, and I'm going to pray. God, do you want me to go? Do you want me to give? Do you want me to do both? I promise the return on investment is worth it. It's worth it. Um, so I'm challenging you, if, if you want to make that commitment today, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a card and I'm going to pray. If I can be here Wednesday, if I can be here Thursday, if I can be here Saturday, I'm going to be here all three nights. I want to hear what God's doing all over the world. I want, I want, to, I want to see what God is doing. I, I promise you're going to be challenged, you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be inspired. But if, you're gonna, if you would be willing to make that commitment, I'm going to encourage you. Though, in a moment we're going to stand, the altars are open, just come pray. Maybe you just need to come today and pray for all of our missionaries. You probably know some by name and just pray for them. There's, there's missionaries all over the country here that can't get back into the country that God's called them to. Pray, pray God would open up the doors. But let's pray that God would send more laborers. Lord, we thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be a part of what you're doing all over the world. Challenge us to invest in what you are doing. Thank you for letting us be a part, a small part of your work. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing this morning.